Welcome to the lecture for Abnormal Psych. I'll uh, be talking today some more about personality disorders. So we'll hit uh, cluster B and cluster C. Cluster B uh, addressing antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic. And cluster C, the avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. So start off with cluster B. Uh, overall, these are grouped together again because of uh, perceived similarities in some of the symptom patterns. Uh, these are individuals that may appear dramatic, emotional, or erratic. And again, it's antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic. Looking at the first one, antisocial personality disorder. So as with all personality disorders, there's this pervasive pattern of behavior, right? Of uh, kind of inner experience and behavior. And for antisocial, it's a pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. And this one has an age specifier in it, unlike some other ones. So it has to be present um, specifically since age 15. Most of the personality disorders, they say for a long time since, you know, uh, early adulthood or adolescence. But this one is a bit more particular, as we'll see, uh, it has to do with um, another disorder, conduct disorder. So this pattern has been going on since at least uh, age 15 with three or more of the following indicators. So... Uh, repeatedly uh, fails to conform to social norms related to laws, so they break the law uh, a lot. Um, whether or not they get caught uh, is irrelevant to the diagnosis, right? Usually um, documentation for diagnosis helps if they've been caught, because you're talking about they've broken the law, um, but even people that get away with it, uh, if they repeatedly break the law, because they just don't think it applies to them, that would meet criteria. Uh, deceitfulness. Uh, lying and conning, and it's usually um, with antisocial personality disorder, uh, it's the deceitfulness is about um, kind of conning, getting over on someone, lying to get out of something, to get something from somebody. So it's not to, um, as we'll see maybe with some other disorders, it's not necessarily to, you know, look better, trying, you know, lie to impress people or lie because you're embarrassed. This is a lie, uh, usually to hurt someone or swindle someone out of something. Uh, impulsivity, so uh, some reckless uh, behavior. Uh, irritability and aggressiveness uh, can sometimes uh, be part of the, the symptom presentation. Uh, consistent irresponsibility. Um, so, you know, somebody who you know, are supposed to be taking care of uh, financially, say, their children, and they uh, they don't. That would uh, tick the box here for antisocial personality disorder. Right? So they're supposed to do things. There are certain expectations of them, and they consistently fail to, to meet those. And then one of the kind of the, the cardinal virtues here, uh, a lack of remorse. Really, um, not just, yeah, I don't care, but really they do care. They really don't seem to care, and they may be confused, like, uh, what, you know, why did you do this to this person? Can't you see how upset they are? And then really being perplexed and saying, well, why would I be upset? They're the one that's crying. I don't, I don't understand. You know, it's like, oh, it does not compute. Really, at a fundamental level, uh, this lack of uh, empathy leading to a lack of remorse for, for wrongdoing, for, for hurting other people. Um, so you have to be at least 18 to be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder which is, again, separates it from some of the other personality disorders. Most personality disorders you probably shouldn't diagnose in uh, adolescence, definitely not in childhood. Um, but this is one where the, it's part of the criteria that says, you know, you can't diagnose it if they're under 18. So they have to be at least 18, and they have to have evidence of having met criteria for conduct disorder before the age of 15. Uh, and conduct disorder basically being the, the childhood adolescent version of this where um, – kids are consistently breaking rules. And that uh, looks a little different, obviously, in childhood. So uh, sneaking out at night uh, could be also some other more dangerous things, setting fires, hurting animals, hurting other people, getting into fights. Um, so everyone with antisocial anti personality disorder early in their life met criteria for conduct disorder. Whether or not they were diagnosed by somebody, doesn't matter. All that matters is historically, you can go back and say, oh, yeah, Based on what people are saying, what you're saying about how you were when you were, you know, a teenager or a child, yep, you met criteria for conduct disorder, therefore you can now meet criteria for antisocial personality disorder. 
So the idea being, if a kid is kind of uh, doesn't have conduct disorder through uh, adolescence, and all of a sudden there's this adult who's doing all these things, well, that's not antisocial personality disorder. There must be some other reason they're they're doing it. And the idea being, okay, well, um, now you're going to look for some other cause of pathology. Maybe they have a brain tumor, you know, on their frontal lobe, causing this change in personality. Uh, because for these individuals, it really does seem to be this characterological thing that goes back and has roots um, early on. Uh, and this disorder also has a kind of a rule out that it doesn't occur only as part of schizophrenia or as, as in the course of bipolar disorder, particularly with uh, mania. Sometimes people can be, you know, irritable and aggressive and impulsive um, and even break some laws if while they're manic. But if they only do it while they're manic, well, it's not the personality disorder. That's just part of um, bipolar disorder. Uh, same thing with schizophrenia. It can look sometimes a little like antisocial personality disorder. Like when you have the ir consistent irresponsibility, where they're not uh, doing things they're supposed to do. But again, it's usually for different reasons. Because the, the, the thought disorder aspect of schizophrenia is interfering with them being able to do the things that... Um, they're supposed to do. And they also have a volition where they have a, a lack of a will to do things. Something like, oh, yeah, there's my sandwich across the room. I get up. And you think, oh, I'm going to get up and get my sandwich. And not being able to will themselves to get up and do that thing. That's one of the symptoms we'll see of uh, schizophrenia. Um, so if you have some of these symptoms, but they're part of these other disorders, you don't add uh, the personality disorder on top. Borderline personality disorder. This one is a pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal relationships, self-image, and not affects affect, um, and marked impulsivity. So it's all about instability. So your relationships are unstable, how you see yourself is unstable, and your emotional experience, your affect, is unstable. And then along with it, there's impulsivity, which is just a kind of a behavioral marker of um, instability. So, five or more symptoms, including uh, the frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. So, if people really are like, oh, I'm out of here, I'm not dealing with this anymore, frantic efforts to avoid that. No, please don't go begging, uh, doing whatever it takes to keep somebody from leaving. And But there's also this imagined abandonment, right? Because there's because of the instability and the insecurity, if they're going to the store to get some cigarettes, maybe they're really just going to get some cigarettes, but they go, oh, no, they're leaving me. So this imagine abandonment, and they're going to take these drastic steps um, to keep them, which can make it look a little bit like histrionic sometimes because they can, uh, the behavior can be a bit um, theatrical. Uh, unstable and intense relationships characterized by alternating between idealization and devaluation, right? So uh, kind of bedeviling and... Um, deifying right where one day if you're in a relationship with somebody who has kind of borderline features borderline personality disorder you know you're the best ever and wow you're the greatest boyfriend girlfriend brother sister whatever i've ever met i can't believe you're so great the next day or maybe even later that day you are the worst i can't believe you would do this what a horrible person you are worthless you're dead to me and then it'll flip back and not only is there that kind of uh, alternating between idealizing and devaluing of a person, sometimes you'll see um, if they're acting with a, a system. So a, a friend group, for example, they'll do something called splitting where they'll idealize one and devalue the other to um, split those two apart. Uh, and then that can switch as well, which again leads to um, significant instability in interpersonal relationships. Uh, unstable self-image and generally feeling uh, the self self-image is generally negative right so it's not like sometimes they feel like they're the best and then they feel like they're the worst it, it generally has a negative um, bent to it uh, but in terms of who they are what they want what they want in life that's where you see the instability not sure of who they not, not in terms of uh, amnesia I don't know who I am but not sure of um, what they should be doing. Um, you might see uh, changes in major and in, in career frequently because just trying to figure out who they are and we'll, we'll bounce from one identity to the next.
but not like dissociative identity disorder, more in terms of interests and activities. Uh, engaging in self-damaging impulsivity, so things like um, uh, reckless, uh, you know, unprotected sex, uh, binge eating, uh, substance abuse, um, doing things that are dangerous and doing them impulsively. Uh, recurrent suicidal behaviors, gestures, or threats, or self-mutilating behavior, uh, like cutting. Affective instability due to reactivity of mood. Uh, and this is where you know, the mood will last uh, a few hours to a few days. Whereas, you know, we'll look at people often confuse borderline personality disorder with bipolar disorder, rapid cycling. But again, bipolar disorder, rapid cycling... You're going through four mood episodes in a year, right? Because those mood episodes are, you know, for a manic episode, at least a week, depressive, two weeks, often longer. So long periods of time with borderline personality disorder, the mood episode, the mood that person is experiencing doesn't last that long, right? Could be a couple of hours of kind of dysphoric, angry, upset mood, and then be normal or be kind of uh, seemingly happy. And it can cycle through in a day. Um, and that mood reactivity, that reactivity word is important because that kind of also helps you differentiate between this and um, bipolar disorder. A bipolar disorder, like a manic episode, can be triggered by something in the environment where the mood, the mood episode is reacting to. Something happened, you know, you got to raise the work, and now you're manic. But once you're manic, you're going to stay manic for a while, for a couple of days, right? At least a week, by, de by definition. And let's say something bad happens, it's going to bounce off you because you're manic, Whereas with borderline personality disorder, something good happens, may feel really great, and something bad happens, or something you interpret as being bad, mood's going to drop. So the mood, the mood is much more reactive to what happens in the environment, uh, and particularly in terms of um, interpersonal relationships. If things are going well, and you think the person is being sweet, very happy, and as soon as there's this perception that they're not, or that they're going to leave you or hurt you, then the mood can shift um, rapidly and dramatically. Um, chronic feelings of emptiness, right? So, um, let me go ahead and jump one down below it too. Also, inappropriate, intense anger. And it's not a, a symptom of the DSM, but intense emotionality is kind of a feature of borderline personality disorder. So you get intense anger, you get intense joy, intense sadness. But partly because of the way the brain works, with that intensity, there is kind of a, a burning up of the the energy of the the you know neurons firing neurotransmitters being uh, depleted and the brain's got to reset and so in between there's this feeling of emptiness right you feel things so strongly so much you can only feel so strongly for so long the brain is out of juice and you're left with these kind of longer periods of, uh, of emptiness and you know what does it mean and then the only way to get out of emptiness is to do something to shift it back into high gear and get angry get happy in a big way um, transient uh, stress, missing an S there, stress related paranoid ideation or severe dissociative symptoms. Right, so paranoid ideation where it looks a little bit like paranoid personality disorder or like a psychotic episode where uh, they may think that somebody is out to get them, people are watching them. But this again tends to um, be come and go, transient, and be stress related. So periods of high stress, something bad is happening, you know, the end of a relationship, which happens frequently. During that breakup period, you may have some paranoid ideation or may have some dissociative symptoms, right? And this is where you have the depersonalization, derealization. Uh, they may lose time, lose a sense of reality, lose a sense of um, when they are, where they are, who they are. Uh, but again, these are symptoms that uh, in periods of tense stress, how they may respond. And then when the stress abates, the symptoms will abate as well. Okay, histrionic personality uh, disorder, a pervasive pattern of emotionality and attention seeking with five or more of the following symptoms. So uncomfortable when not the center of attention. If they're in a room with other people, uh, just feeling really uh, kind of fidgety and anxious when not uh, people aren't paying attention to them and they will then change their behavior. They will do something to get your attention. Uh, in you know interject into the conversation uh, engage in some uh, 
sexual behavior, which was one of the other things, somehow they will draw attention back to them. So that means uh, often inappropriately uh, sexually sed seductive or provocative, um, which is important to note, kind of going back to bipolar disorder for a minute, when people are manic, uh, sometimes they become inappropriately sexual, uh, sexually seductive and provocative. So you kind of want to rule that out too if somebody's acting that way, uh, coming on strong, you know, and they're, they're not at a club and they're not uh, under a substance, could be mania, could be histrionic. Uh, rapidly shifting and shallow expression of emotions. So, um, you know, talking about something, uh, you know, people are talking about something that happened in the news it's, that said, oh, um, this thing happened, it's really sad, these people died, and oh, isn't it the worst ever? Oh, but did you hear about those those kids were res rescued from the cave in Thailand? Yes, it's super wonderful, and it's the best thing ever. And so really going rapidly from one extreme to the other in their emotional expression, but it's shallow. There's no real substance there. They don't really seem that happy or that upset. Um, everything's kind of surface level. You're not really, there's something beneath the surface, but they're not going to let you see it. They're just going to let you see um, what's, uh, uh, what's above the surface. Uh, a tendency to use physical appearance to draw attention to the self, right? Which is something that all people do, obviously, to, to some degree, uh, you know, comb your hair in the morning. Um, but this is uh, an exaggerated way of doing it. So uh, excessive uh, accessories, jewelry, makeup, um, you know, fedora, whatever it might be. An impressionistic style of speech lacking in detail. Oh, so what do you think of the movie? Oh, yes, it was... It was everything that, yes, it was, hmm, what? Did you say anything? No. So you may have a conversation with someone, and if they say a bunch of words, but there's nothing there, that would be kind of an impressionistic style of speech, lack of detail, where they're just kind of saying some words, but no real meat, nothing, no substance behind them. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, uh, theatricality and the exaggeration of emotion, so everything's kind of bigger, uh, um, then maybe the situation merits, uh, almost like, do you think you're on stage right now? Or do you think you're being recorded? They're playing to the camera when no camera is present. And this one, is, I always find interesting, they tend to be suggest suggestible. So people say, hey, yeah, let's go um, spray paint the water tower. Okay, let's do that, that sounds good. They'll very easily go along with plans of anybody in the crowd, um, which I guess you could say they're doing that because they see it as an opportunity to possibly gain attention later, uh, but it just doesn't fit that well uh, with the other the other symptoms um, in my mind. Uh, and this one, though, does. Uh, they typically consider relationships to be more intimate than they really are. Oh, yes, my dearest friend uh, at the checkout aisle at HEB. The, the person you, you talked to, you know, three times in the past year, yes, um, they're, they're very close. We, hmm. Again, you get that impressionistic speech. We're not really saying much, and they, they have this perception, and it's not just that they're portraying that they're closer to people than they really are. They're not just, oh, yeah, Jack Nichols is my best friend. They're not just lying, although they do tend to lie. Um, they tend to perceive that things, relationships are closer than they really are. So if you're kind of acquaintances, they'll probably think you're friends. If you're friends, they'll think you're best friends. If you're best friends, that would be rare, then they probably think you're soulmates. Okay, narcissistic personality disorder. A pervasive pattern of grandiosity uh, in fantasy or behavior. So either they act grandiose or in their mind, they're grandiose. Uh, and also a need for ad admiration and a lack of empathy exhibited by five or more of the following. A grandiose sense of self-importance. So they think that they're just uh, terrific and not just great, but greater than you, right? It's usually in this kind of downward social comparison that uh, they think they are better than others. Uh, Frequently preoccupied with fantasies of success, uh, power, brilliance, ideal love. So they uh, will be daydreaming about um, being the best ever, the smartest ever, and have this kind of uh, rich fantasy life of uh, 
extreme greatness either of their abilities or their relationships. They tend to believe they're special and can therefore be only be understood by high status others. Oh, uh, you wouldn't understand. You're not one of us. Let me speak to the president. You know, and they may be talking about the president of the United States, the president of the company. But again, the type of person that is always going to ask you to speak to someone at a higher level because, well, I'm me, you see. Um, tend to require excessive admiration. Uh, so they'll be uh, upset if not getting that admiration and they'll, they'll make that known. I don't understand why you don't appreciate how great I am. What's wrong with you, imbecile? I didn't think you were quite that stupid. Uh, has a sense of entitlement. So I should get this. Um, so there's this long line of people at a movie. But lines are obviously for peons. I deserve not to wait. And so they'll just skip right on head to the front of the line. Right? Um, interpersonally exploitative. So take it, taking advantage of others. Because again, others are lesser. So what does it matter if you're taking advantage of them? It all kind of flows from I am worth more than they. Therefore, their needs, concerns, wants don't really matter. And again, related to that, uh, tends to be a, a lacking in empathy. Because why would I care about how other people are feeling if they are less than? But there's some insecurity to this, right? Because they tend to be also envious of others or sometimes think that other people are envious of them. Oh, they're just jealous. They want what I have. But even if they see people that have stuff that they don't have, why do they have that? They're not as good as me. But they have stuff that you don't have. They're going to do things you can't do. And so there's that, that envy. doesn't seem fair. Uh, and then overall kind of a uh, display of arrogance, a haughtiness, carry themselves with... Um, just a sense that they are better than other people. Okay, so coming back to these uh, cluster B uh, disorders. For antisocial personality disorder, uh, one thing to keep in mind is there's this kind of developmental pathway. And diagnostically, we know that um, to be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, you need to meet, have met criteria for conduct disorder before the age of 15. So that means that everybody with antisocial personality disorder has previously met criteria for conduct disorder. Now, to meet criteria for conduct disorder, you don't have to have been diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, but it frequently happens. Almost everybody that meets criteria for conduct disorder also meets or previously met criteria for oppositional defiant disorder. Now, almost everyone, not everyone, but almost everyone that meets criteria for oppositional defiant disorder also meets or met at some point in time criteria for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Which you can see how that, well, I don't know, hopefully you can see how that might uh, make sense. If somebody has some attention problems and so they're, uh, you know, they're watching TV, playing their video games, and some parental figure says, hey, uh, put your shoes up. And again, attention deficits or have a hard time shifting attention, focus attention away from things. They don't hear it, right? Don't process it. So the parent says it again, still doesn't get it. Now the parent is yelling, I told you to put your shoes up. And the kid hears it now, but they hear this parent yelling, dang, why are they so angry at me? And that is going to pull for some oppositional behavior, some defiance possibly. And that could ultimately start a pattern. So you can see how ADHD might lead into oppositionality. And once you become oppositional and you are telling no to authorities, well, then it's not that, not too far late thing. Okay, well, if you're saying no to authorities, you might start breaking the law, and then you get into conduct disorder, and then um, obviously that uh, is a requirement for antisocial personality disorder. So, most people with antisocial met criteria for conduct, optional, and ADHD. However, only a very small percentage of people with ADHD will go on to meet cri criteria for antisocial personality disorder, right? So, it's not this, oh, if you have ADHD, well, okay, you're going to have this antisocial personality thing. No. You might, and most everybody that has that finishes there had ADHD, but it's not uh, um, it's not certainly not predestined predestined. But there is this possible pathway where there's some early deficits 
uh, that might put you at risk for this, which means if we're going to have intervention, it probably needs to happen early on. When we talk about antisocial personality disorder, often people say, well, is that the same thing as you know, uh, somebody who's a psychopath or a sociopath? Maybe. Uh, this is something that's, um, there's not agreement in the scientific community uh, about uh, these labels. Some people see uh, psychopathy, sociopathy as subsets of antisocial personality disorder. Um, with uh, the DSM-5 from DSM-4, there's more of a shift towards making antisocial personality disorder look more like our understanding of uh, what psychopathy is. Uh, in terms of it's the criteria are closer to about I mean dispositions before they were just about behaviors if you do this 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 and this you have this personality disorder which means that like everybody in prison would meet criteria because they're all breaking the law and that's pretty much all you needed uh, whereas for the personality disorder it really needs to be about their character about how they are not just what they do because there's a variety of reasons to break the law for somebody with a personality disorder they're breaking the law because they really don't care about the law it, again looks a little bit like narcissistic personality disorder because it doesn't apply to them. The, the laws, you know, these human laws are meaningless, right? I'm going to do what I want to do and I don't care who it hurts because it doesn't bother me. I don't have empathy for others. So, uh, um, psychopathy, sociopathy, it's mixed up in there with antisocial, but the kind of the thread that runs through all of them that kind of ties it together is that um, callous unemotional traits that and callous thing like calluses on your hands a hardened heart where things really don't seem to bother you and they're not putting on a face like they're they're not acting like it doesn't bother them when they've hurt someone it really doesn't bother them it's not registering affectively emotionally cognitively i can see they're crying and i can deduce that they're likely sad that i uh, you know stabbed their kitten but no i don't feel bad about it Right. Okay, that's a psychopath, a sociopath, somebody who meets with here for antisocial personality disorder. Um, not surprisingly, pretty treatment resistant. And so again, you go back to that development pathway. If we're going to intervene for these folks, we probably have to do it early and figure out, okay, how can we change that trajectory early on? Uh, and again, not just because oftentimes these folks end up uh, in prison, because sometimes they don't. Sometimes they end up... Um, in public office or in uh, corporate America. Right? Like if you're gonna, you know, sell a product that you know uh, is uh, lethal, causes cancer, there's gotta be at some level some sociopathy there. If you have that knowledge and you keep doing it, well, I don't really care about those people. I like money. There's a case you made that there's some antisocial personality disorders involved in businesses like that, maybe. Um, borderline personality disorder. This is one, again, that the, the key feature is instability, right? Instability of identity, affect, and relationships. Um, and it's the name borderline kind of comes from uh, a way of thinking that's not uh, not held anymore. But that, that, okay, that these features are somewhere between um, uh, psychopathy and neuroticism, kind of older ways of looking at um Psychopathology, which I mean, if you wonder, well, what's that name mean? Well, you should be on the border of two things we thought, but we don't think of that anymore. But the name stuck around. Um, if it were renamed today, it'd probably be, you know, interpersonal instability disorder. Um, but the thing that people often um, want to talk about in terms of borderline personality disorder is the the kind of the scary part, the the, the self harm, which may take the form of, of cutting, uh, other types of harm, self harming too. Um, and then the, the suicidal gestures, uh, and some people say, well, you know, they're just, they're just doing it for attention. And in my experience, the individuals that meet criteria for borderline personality status order, um, it's not the case. Uh, they may get attention for it. And at some point the suicidal gestures may be used manipulatively, right? Because again, they have this fear of abandonment and they, okay, People are drifting away from me. They're, they don't care about me. They're going to forget about me. Well, last time I said I was going to kill myself, everybody got real concerned and, and they came back close. So yeah, there's some manipulation that goes with that. But it's not because they're just having fun watching people dance as they you know make these threats. 
it is because of the instability, the emotional stability, and the fear they have, right? And trying to keep people close. And I think one of the, the troubling things is sometimes people, you know, it's hard to live with someone that uh, is is struggling with borderline personality disorder, right? It's it's frustrating, and you feel manipulated. And you go, oh, they're just doing this again. No, they're just saying it. They may just be saying it, but they might not be. So you always have to take um, suicide ideation seriously. Um, you have to follow through, and you it's um, you know kind of the the cost of, of ignoring it. It's kind of like the boy who cried wolf uh, story. The significant cost if you say, oh, I think they're just trying to play me. I'm going to ignore it this time and not do something about it. Okay, that's something again unfortunate may happen. Uh, the cutting behavior happens for a variety of reasons. For uh, it's very individual. Uh, even for within an individual, it can happen for different reasons at different points in time. Uh, sometimes people will engage in cutting, and this is one I think that uh, people say, oh, they're cutting for attention. That is rarely the case. Sometimes happens, because most of the times cutting is something that's hidden, right? It's uh, a behavior that a lot of shame is tacked on to. So you'll see wearing long sleeves or cutting in places that people can't see uh, in, in um, kind of everyday uh, uh, clothing. Sometimes cutting is done uh, because people do have that, that uh, unstable self-image and they have self-loathing self and they feel they need to be punished for uh, doing something bad. You know, they've uh, said something mean to some friend because of that instability in their first relationships and now I've got to pay for it, right? So there's some, sometimes it's self-punishment. Sometimes you have those chronic feelings of uh, emptiness and it's like, I, I want to feel something and you engage in that act of physical harm to your body and... You know, those pain receptors are kicking off and, and activating the brain and you feel something. And that's at least not nothing. Right? Um, but cutting behaviors are, are complicated, but ultimately largely, um, I think, best thought of as a coping mechanism. Not a super healthy coping, coping mechanism, but a coping mechanism. That, that's what it is. It's a way of dealing with what's going on in the world at that point in time. Um, borderline personality disorder, you know, all personality disorders have fairly high rates of comorbidity. Uh, this one, um, arguably more so than some others, as we've mentioned before, fairly high rates of comorbidity with, um, bulimia nervosa, also depression, uh, substance use, and then other personality disorders. In terms of, uh, treatment, it's not easy, but, uh, there are some, some strategies out there that seem to be pretty effective. Um, Marshall Linehan's developed uh, dialectical behavior therapy, uh, which is a type of cognitive behavioral therapy, really, uh, just a little more intense with some follow-ups. You know, where you got group, individual, you're following up with phone calls to keep people on track and um, dealing with behaviors in a, in a particular sequence uh, that has some success. And some, uh, because of the, you know, the idealizing and devaluing uh, and the, the instability, some uh, treatment providers are reluctant to work with people with borderline personality disorder. Uh, tend to have a higher uh, risk for, you know, kind of, um, the concern is there's greater risk for malpractice. They're going to get mad at you and then try to sue you, or they're going to kill themselves and you're going to feel bad about it. You know, you, if you became a therapist, you, this is what you signed up for. Uh, these are people uh, in pain, right? Uh, often a, a significant amount of, of pain um, and not always but quite frequently relating back to childhood trauma uh, and they they can benefit from treatment uh, and I think um, certainly deserve deserve a chance uh, histrionic personality disorder this is one we've talked about a couple times um, Conscious, some contrary around uh, that this, this is a, a gender bias in terms of uh, criterion bias, where this seems to be kind of uh, pathologizing a hyper femininity in terms of the attention seeking, the uh, pr provocative sexual behavior, um, because you're you're less likely to pathologize uh, provocative sexual behavior in a man than you are a woman. I don't know if you are, but people in general have been that way. So there may be some gender bias in the construction of this disorder. Uh, it may be that um, either um, 
the same pathology that you know looks like antisocial personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder in men that the same thing that's going on there is going on when it goes on with women it gets labeled as histrionic maybe not clear um, in general it seems like these folks are really just desperate for love and attention and they engage in behaviors that are successful in the short term at getting attention sometimes even love right so they do big dramatic things and big gestures and people, wow what are what a romantic oh they care about me so much you know because they're doing things to draw you in but ultimately these behaviors are really unsuccessful in the long run in getting their needs met uh, and which sets up the cycle well now i've got to do something more something bigger or with someone else so again so this is where you have some overlap with borderline where you have some unstable relationships going from one to the next because the hist this histrionic pattern doesn't work well with one other person for very long it kind of burns out um but the, this uh need for attention the the shifting of emotions one thing i think is interesting is the idea of uh niche finding that people with different personality disorders can kind of find their place in the world like with antisocial personality disorder again politics business might find a way to be successful with this way of dealing with the world looking out for number one without worrying about others to be successful at least on, on some measures uh and you might think of with, with histrionic where might people be uh successful if they're um kind of uh surface level emotions uh but also very uh theatrical and like to be the center of attention all eyes on them some uh, performing arts it, you know you may do fine you may have very limited impairment and if so it's not a disorder it's just a personality narcissistic personality disorder um this is one that uh overlaps a fair bit with other personality disorders in particular antisocial and histrionic right because with antisocial both of those you have some lacking of empathy uh, and with uh, uh, histrionic right wanting to be the center of attention and then feeling like well of course why wouldn't I be the center? I'm the best thing ever so when you're trying to distinguish between uh, narcissism and these other PDs uh, it really can be tough sometimes but the key feature here is the, the that grandiosity um, and the, the need for attention and admiration so somebody who's uh, histrionic they'll want attention doesn't necessarily have to be admiration if uh, they're crying and you're holding their hand patting their hand and feeling sorry for them that, they're good yeah getting attention it works a narcissist nope because I don't want you pitying me I don't want that kind of attention I only want the admiration attention uh, tough thing about being a narcissist thinking you're the greatest thing in the world when reality doesn't line up with that when you don't get all the things you think you deserve it, it sucks right and so uh, these folks will often struggle with depression because they see themselves as being great and special and then from they look around there's no evidence that they're great and special so uh, uh, angry at first and then eventually uh, depressed okay moving on to cluster C this is uh, the ones where people may appear anxious or fearful uh, avoidant dependent and obsessive compulsive personality disorders avoidant personality disorder you've got a pervasive pattern of social inhibition feelings of inadequacy and hypersensitivity to a negative evaluation so super shy feel like you're not good enough and are super worried that people are going to judge you for more of the following so you avoid jobs or occupations that are going to involve significant interpersonal contact because of fear of criticism or rejection so typically working in some field where they can be alone because again if they have to work in an office where well, people people are going to look at me and they're going to judge me and they're going to think i'm stupid and they're going to hate me and i can't i can't take i can't handle that so i'm going to avoid those interpersonal situations including occupation employment situations uh, unwilling to get involved with people unless they're certain of being liked right which is this is something that's um it'll be interesting to see what happens um as people are able to connect over the internet um where you can kind of they can 
people with avoidant personality disorder might be able to, you know, get some reassurance, you know, meet someone online and get reassured that, oh, yeah, they like me, they like me, they like me. Okay, now we can meet in person. And so maybe this will make it easier for them to meet people because they can, because again, they can get involved with people, but they have to be really assured that oh yeah you're they're gonna love you you're gonna that's gonna be great right which sometimes a family member can give that reassurance but now maybe they can get that themselves via those the, the initially more anonymous interactions that uh, online communication allows uh, within relationships that they do have they typically show restraint uh, because of fear of being shamed so restraint in terms of not sharing a lot uh, of themselves so they'll be pretty quiet, not going to say much. You know, if I don't say anything, I can't say anything stupid and they won't know I'm stupid or think I'm stupid. Uh, being preoccupied with being criticized or rejected in social situations, uh, being inhibited in new interpersonal situations because of feelings of inadequacy. And so they're very shy, withdrawn, feel like they're not good enough, uh, view themselves as socially inept or unappealing, unattractive. Uh, and they're um, unusually reluctant to take personal risks that may prove embarrassing, right? Hey, yeah, why don't you, we're all going to, we're going bowling. Why don't you, your turn to bowl. No, I can't do bowling. It might slip and fall. People will laugh at me and I'll hurt myself and these shoes stink, right? So not going to do anything, not going to put themselves out there where they could do something that would be embarrassing because they will do something embarrassing and people will judge them and it will be horrible, right? Lots of anxiety about being judged uh, and being found to be less than, right? So kind of like the flip of narcissism. So narcissists think they're way better than they are. People with avoidant personality disorder typically think they're way worse than they really are. Dependent personality disorder. Uh, a pervasive and excessive need to be taken care of that leads to submissive and clinging behavior and fears of separation, right? So somebody who really, as the name implies, depends on others and can't uh, can't be alone it feels like they can't do things for themselves so it's not just about relationally oh uh, like i need have to i have to be relationship. i need a boyfriend i need a girlfriend i need to be loved uh yeah even if they don't love me can they balance my checkbook will they take care of me because i can't take care of myself that's really what's at the core of dependent personality disorder more than the need to uh, be in relation with others so uh, along those lines, they typically have difficulty making everyday decisions without uh, lots of advice and reassurance. Just, hey, uh, paper or plastic? I don't know which one's better. Plastic. But plastic is in the ocean. Is that, is that good? Do you think it's good? Is that right? Or should it be paper? Some paper you can eat on trees, but it can be recycled. I don't know. What should I do? What should I do? I don't want to do the wrong thing. Tell You, you pick. Okay, sir. Paper it. So they can't make just simple everyday decisions. And this is recurrently uh, needing others to assume responsibility for most major areas of life, right? So uh, I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to have my checks deposited in your account and you pay the bills. I can't do it. I just can't deal with it. Um, could, hey, I, I think I'm supposed to go to the doctor, but I'm not sure. Could you figure that out and schedule it for me? I don't know. Right? Uh, difficulty expressing disagreement with others for fear of loss of approval or support. Again, so uh, somebody says, um, you know, the um, Kobe's Lakers could have beat Jordan's Bulls every day of the week. And, you know, and some this person says, all this knows that's not true. But they can't disagree, not because uh, they don't want to hurt their feelings or because they're afraid they won't be loved or that they'll be judged negatively. Right? It's not that. It's that if I disagree with you, you might leave me. If you leave me, I can't take care of myself. So, yeah, you're right. I that's Kobe's the best ever. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, goes to excessive lengths to obtain nurturance, nurturance and support for others. So similar to that kind of not disagreeing and then doing just anything to, to get people to take care of you. Uh, yeah, I might mean, take care of that stuff for you, but I need you to uh, declaw my cats this weekend and um, the dumpster behind my apartment. Uh, I need you to clean that. Uh, just go ahead and get inside with like a toothbrush. Uh, use your own toothbrush. I want to use one of mine and clean that out for me. Okay, yeah, we'll do, right? So going to Great Lakes, doing gross stuff, doing whatever the person wants, as long as they don't leave. Because if they leave, I can't take care of myself. 
Uh, not surprisingly, feels uncomfortable or helpless when alone because they're afraid they can't take care of themselves. And if a relationship ends, they'll urgently seek another relationship as a source of care. So again, some overlap here with um, borderline personality disorder, where you have these instable relationships where uh, frequently lots of relationships cycling, uh, you know, it's going great and it's horrible, horrible breakup, start a new one pretty much right away. But with someone who's got borderline personality disorder, they're not starting a new one because they need someone to take care of them. They may think, oh, I can take care of myself. They're getting back in a relationship because usually they want the the excitement and the drama to again feel something uh, and enjoying those those highs and uh, to balance the emotional lows. Whereas dependent personality disorder, it's about really being taken care of. And so along those lines, unrealistically preoccupied with fears of being left to take care of uh, their self. Right. So some with um, generalized anxiety disorder, worrying about everything all the time. These folks not worrying about everything, worrying about being left. So, OK, are they have am I doing everything I need to do so they don't leave because they might leave. And if they leave, that'd be horrible. Oh, my gosh. What else can I do? I got to keep thinking about it and I got to be vigilant about this. Keep it on the forefront of my mind. Again, using that worry to protect yourself from the feared event. Uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Last one. Uh, pervasive pattern of preoccupation with orderliness, perfectionism, and mental and interpersonal control at the expense of flexibility, openness, and efficiency. So things got to be your way, got to be just that, 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 but to the point that it ain't working. Four more of the following. Um, oops, sorry, I put it up there so you can see it. Uh, preoccupied with uh, details, rules, lists, order, schedule, to the extent where the point of the activity is lost. So any of you who've been on vacation with someone who has uh, OCPD or some OCPD traits can probably identify with this where, okay, all right, at nine o'clock, we're going to, we're going to get up, we're going to have breakfast and we're going to have breakfast from uh, nine o'clock to 9.30 at 9.30. We're going to get on the bus and the bus is going to travel for seven minutes at 9.37. We'll arrive at our location and there's everything is scheduled, scheduled, scheduled to the point that you can't enjoy yourself because, hey, this Grand Canyon isn't beautiful. It's very lovely, but we need to go. It's now 1032 at 1032. We now need to be on the next bus, but we're enjoying the thing. I don't care. The schedule doesn't matter if you're having fun. What matters is the schedule. What would matter is following the rules, doing it this way, in this order. Right. So, so preoccupied with the details that the, the point of what you're doing, uh, especially when it involves fun, it is lost. Um, perfectionism that interferes with task completion. Right. So this isn't about, oh, yeah, how do they like to make it right? So they take extra time. No, they take so much time, they never get it done. Right. So they'll rewrite that essay. They'll write the essay. No, rewrite it. Rewrite it again. Rewrite it again. So far, so good. You should probably rewrite it a couple of times. They rewrite it again and again and again. Deadline comes. Still rewriting. Deadline passes. Still rewriting. Now, well, no point, no point turning in now, got a zero, right? So the perfectionism is interfering with getting it done. So it's not just that you're trying hard, trying so hard to get it, not just good, but perfect that it doesn't get done. Uh, being excessively devoted to work and productivity to the exclusion of leisure activities and friendships. So being a, a workaholic, right? Because again, Got to go, got to do, got to be more, more, more. And again, uh, it's something that in you know, U.S. Uh, Western culture, we value productivity, value work. But even in our own um, work-minded, driven culture, there's kind of a line somewhere. Okay, you're working too much. You don't spend any time with anybody, family, friends, having any fun, enjoying things. What's the point? Well, the point is you got to do, you got to be more. Being over conscientious and inflexible about morality, ethics, and values. So um, things are very black and white. There's no gray. Well, no, this is right and that's wrong. And how can't you, how, why don't you understand that? This is, this is the way it's got to be. Right? And very kind of dogmatic about, about that. Um, you know, you're playing, uh, uh, 
monopoly and you land uh, somebody lands on free parking and they go to take the money in the middle because that's how your house rules play. That's, that's not a rule of monopoly. I read the rules. It doesn't say that in the rules. Well, it's our house rule. We played it. No, it's not written in the rules. you got to follow the rules. So down to petty things and even bigger things, um, issues of uh, morals and values, inflexible. It's so not willing to consider other people's points of view because, again, it has to be this way, typically my way. Uh, unable to discard worn out worthless objects um, uh, if you know we're not talking about you know sentimental things oh your your teddy bear from when you were a kid no not that stuff that's just uh, you know the receipt from McDonald's from last year was that a special day no no just uh, you know might be an audit sometime so better keep track of that well, they're probably not gonna audit your fast food receipts but you never know they might because again you might need it so Better not throw it in. Might need it at some point. Reluctant to delegate tasks to others unless those others agree, agree to do it exactly their way. Right. So it's really about control. It's got to be done. If it's got to be done, only I can do it right. Okay, maybe I'll trust you if you agree to follow these exact parameters. And I'm probably still going to monitor you and make sure you're doing it right. And then even I'll probably do it afterward to make sure it's done right. Because I'm not sure you can really follow the rules the way I want them to be followed. Um, kind of a miserly attitude attitude toward uh, money and spending was generally because they're hoarding money for some future catastrophe. Because again, you never know. Some this, this kind of anxiety of something bad could happen. Got to be ready. Got to follow this. Do do it right. Otherwise, otherwise what? I don't know. Otherwise bad. Right. So got to have the money for what? Because otherwise, if you don't have the money, it's bad. Uh, and then just generally showing uh, rigidity and stubbornness my way or the highway again four more of those uh, indicators okay sum up the cluster c avoidant personality disorder now this hopefully it jumped out at you that this has a lot of overlap with one of the anxiety disorders we talked about earlier right where you have this really this you're avoiding because you have a fear of negative evaluation right so when you have a fear of being negatively evaluated when performing some activity, that's social anxiety, or it used to be social phobia. Um, these might be the same disorder, right? If you have somebody presenting with either avoidant personality disorder or social anxiety disorder, where they've been previously diagnosed, they come into you know a, a lab setting and they describe what's going on in their life, and you have a bunch of clinicians in there, it's a 50-50 which diagnosis they're going to get. Right. So this really may be uh, a case where the DSM has uh, the same thing in the book twice. Um, with, again, the thing being, oh, well, a personality disorder is supposed to be uh, more kind of pervasive and stable and lifelong. Uh, in social anxiety disorder, it can be circumscribed to particular activities, right? Stage fright, uh, throwing a baseball back to, to the pitcher. But if you have more of a generalized social anxiety where it's in most settings, well, then it looks a whole lot like this personality disorder. And people that have that typically say, yeah, I've all, kind of always been this way, which makes it sound a lot more like a personality disorder What's going back to early adulthood, adolescence. One of the good things is, um, this is one of the personality disorders that has uh, um, more uh, research on treatment than the others. Because again, people often don't come in for treatment of a personality disorder. Uh, but there's a fair bit of stuff on avoidant and also the stuff with social anxiety as well works because it's the same disorder. Um, and fairly successful at treating it in terms of uh, kind of cognitive behavioral uh, stuff where you're treating the, the anxiety, right? Teaching social skills, uh, frequently using a, a group setting, group therapy. We have individuals that are able to um, practice um, um, via uh, role play social interactions and then getting feedback okay when you do this uh, did anybody think they sounded awkward or looked weird or uh, seemed dumb no we didn't and they get that direct feedback you know from other group members and that can be really helpful uh, dependent personality disorder this is one where um, there's certainly some culturally influenced views of dependence and if dependence is is good or bad in kind of U.S. Western culture, again, we tend to really value independence. And yes, that that's the thing is to do it yourself. 
Uh, go on your own. Don't rely on others. But that isn't the same across the world. In some places, it's that, oh, well, if you try to you know, do it yourself, why? What are you trying to, to show off? And don't you care about everybody else? Are you going to leave them behind? No, everybody works together. You depend on them. They depend on you, right? Uh, is that, uh, where, where is that saying is from? Somewhere in Africa. That you can, um, you can go fast alone. You can go far together. Right? There's that idea that, yeah, really, if you rely on each other, you can accomplish more. So we tend to pathologize dependence a bit more. But even with that being the case, um, folks that meet criteria for dependent personality disorder do seem, even if you were to transplant them into a culture that um, valued independence less, they probably feel like, ooh, you should be able to decide what to wear without people having to reassure you it's it's okay to wear that, right? It's fine to check in, but really lots of reassurance needed. There does seem to be uh, an anxiety to this. It's not just about being dependent on people. It's about the fear of them not being there, right? So if you depend on others and you're not worried about, yeah, I depend on them and, and they do things for me and that's great and it works out well. Okay, well, it's not the person I swear. It's where you depend on them and you're freaking out about the possibility that they might not be there for you. Okay, that's where it more morphs into um, the personality disorder. One thing to think about, though, just kind of a, a thought exercise is if somebody has dependent personality disorder, as described in the DSM, and they're in a long-term, fairly stable relationship with someone else who is taking care of, you know, major areas of life functioning, uh, reassuring them about what to wear, telling them what to do. What pathology, if any, might exist in the, that partner that's doing that, right? So to be in a relationship with somebody who depends on you completely and needs constant reassurance, to constantly give that reassurance and be okay with that, what kind of person is that? Something to think about. Uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Again, not the same thing as obsessive compulsive disorder, right? You don't typically have obsessions and or compulsions in the personality disorder, which is what you have to have for OCD. And people say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm so OCD. Typically, they don't mean that they have obsessions and compulsions. They mean that, oh, I'm kind of rigid. I like things to be a certain way. So you say, oh, I'm so OCPD. That's better because that's that's what most of us mean when we when when we say that is in terms of uh, being perfectionistic, uh, a bit rigid. Um, but again, they don't tend to overlap. Where people with OCPD and OCD, you don't see dual diagnosis uh, very often. Some folks with OCD that have obsessions, compulsions that follow rules ritualistically um, can look a little OCPD, but really they are they are different phenomenon. Uh, you can have this personality disorder. And hoarding disorder, right? We said one of the one of the criteria was uh, having a hard time throwing things away, which can lead to hoarding. And if hoarding becomes prominent, then you might get the additional diagnosis of hoarding disorder. If that's really the only thing you have, it looks like OCPD is the hoarding, then it's just the hoarding disorder. But if you have the other kind of rigid uh, per perfectionistic traits, then it might be both OCPD and hoarding disorder. Okay, take home message. Uh, as you've read about the personality disorders, clusters A, B, and C, uh, and you've thought about it in some lectures, you probably thought, oh, that sounds familiar. I kind of, she kind of, he kind of. Let me just say this. You, or the person you're thinking of, probably doesn't have a personality disorder. Right? Even though there's... They're common compared to some other disorders, right? It's one in 10 uh, Americans will meet criteria for personality disorder. Still, that's only 10%. That's not uh, not super high. And there's certainly some personality disorders that if someone has it, you're not likely to know them. If somebody has paranoid personality disorder, you probably don't know that person because they don't trust you enough to <laughs> give you a chance to know them, right? Um, but... You're not alone in thinking, yeah, that kind of describes me, or that kind of describes this person I know. Because, yeah, these are descriptions of 
personality traits at extreme levels. Right? So if you if you identify with some part of it, yeah, you're identifying with human experience. Uh, sometimes sometimes you uh, worry about the loyalty of others. Sometimes you think you're really great and special and deserve better. Uh, sometimes you worry about people uh, leaving you. Sometimes you like things to be a certain way. Uh, sometimes um, your your emotions uh, are really reactive to if somebody says, you know, you look good, you feel good, and if they make say something mean, you feel bad the rest of the day. You have kind of reactive mood. Yeah, that's just humanity, right? And so don't don't spend too much time thinking about it. Because again, you probably don't have a personality disorder. They probably don't have a personality disorder. Even people that, that are diagnosed may not have personality disorders, right? Because it's messy. This is messier than most other diagnostic categories when we're pathologizing uh, uh, personality. So you probably don't, uh, probably don't have it. Probably. But maybe. Not saying you don't. And if you do, that's fine. It's just a label to apply to describe your behavior. And if it's causing you distress or dysfunction, I certainly encourage you to do something about it because who wants to stress and dysfunction? But it's nothing to uh, beat yourself up about. Okay, um, quick review of the clusters. Uh, cluster A, typically going to be folks that don't want to be around you, right? Either they're paranoid and worried that you're going to out to get them, uh, schizoid and uh, just don't care about people, uh, schizotypal where they're going to be kind of odd and then have some anxiety about uh, social, social interactions. Uh, B, folks that you might not want to be around, right? So who are uh, kind of um, manipulative or deceitful or uh, overly dramatic or emotional. You just kind of take a lot of energy be, to be around uh, cluster B folks. Or cluster C, folks that are anxious. And anxious about different things, right? So these don't hang together as well. Like what they have in common is anxiety, but anxiety for different reasons. Anxious because uh, they think you might be judging them. Anxious because maybe you're going to leave them. Or anxious because you're being messy and screwing up everything that they have um, ordered so neatly. Okay. So last thought about personality disorders. Probably more changes in, in diagnosis and diagnostic criteria uh, to come in the, in the next iteration of the DSM, uh, if the DSM is still around for another iteration. Real close in DSM-5 to changing drastically personality disorders, possibly even throwing them out. Uh, they hung in there, and you got that alternative model in with them too. The next iteration, again, probably something different, probably something closer to a dimensional model. Um, we're looking at um, levels of traits rather than trying to put people in these boxes that just don't seem to fit that well for most people. You're going to have some people that are very kind of prototypical. Oh, this person is completely narcissistic personality disorder, and they only have these traits. They don't have any other ones. But more often you have people that have some of these traits, some of those, kind of high on this, kind of moderate on this. It's more of a, more of a mixed bag. Um, but we'll see what comes next. That's all for now. Take care.